Okay, so welcome back to this next video on uh, T-cell activation. So, so far what we've seen is that when a T-cell receives signal 1 and signal 2, it's going to cause these calcium oscillations in uh, the cytoplasm of the T-cell, basically. And uh, that's because something, um, some membrane-bound protein is causing the opening of calcium channels and allowing calcium uh, from the extracellular fluid to move into the intracellular fluid. Okay, now when calcium goes up in the cytoplasm, calcium is going to bind to uh, calmodulin and create calcium-calmodulin complexes. Calcium-calmodulin complexes bind and activate this enzyme called calcineurin. Now, calcineurin is what's known as a serine threonine phosphatase. So it's a serine threonine phosphatase. So basically, it removes... Uh, oh, dear, oh, yeah, that's fine. Serine threonine phosphatase. It removes phosphate groups which have been added to serine and threonine residues. So this is what calcineurin is. So let me just remind you of the structure of serine and threonine residues. So let's have the basic amino acid structure. So here's the amino group of an amino acid. Here's the alpha carbon with a hydrogen coming off it. Here's the carboxyl group. Uh, here's the hydroxyl group of the carboxyl group, and then we have the alpha, uh, sorry, the R group of the amino acid. Now, in the case of serine, what you would have is a methylene group here and a hydroxyl group there. So this is serine. Now, threonine is exactly the same, but instead of having a proton here, what you could have instead would be a methyl group. So that's what you'd have in threonine. So take off the proton, add on a methyl group, you've got threonine. Okay, the important thing is that what you, this hydroxyl group, you can add a phosphate group to this hydroxyl group. So you can take this proton off and you can bind it to a phosphate group instead, like so. Okay, and that's the phosphorylated serine residue, okay, or the serine threonine residue. So that's what, um, calc well, that's not what calcineurin does. Uh, that's what, um, serine threonine kinases do. Kinases are enzymes which add phosphate groups onto um, amino acid residues. A serine threonine kinase is something that adds phosphate groups onto serine or threonine residues in proteins. Okay, so uh, a serine threonine phosphatase is the exact opposite of a serine threonine kinase. It's going to come here and remove this phosphate group from this hydroxyl group, and it's going to return this to a hydroxyl group, so it's going to bring a proton back on. So it's going to hydrolyze this bond, basically. It will require water, it will split water up, stick the hydroxyl group on um, the phosphate group here, and put that hydrogen back onto that oxygen of the serine threonine residue. Okay, right, so why is this important? Well, there is an important transcription factor uh, in T-cell cytoplasm, known as the nuclear factor of activated T-cells. Okay, so uh, this is going to be the nuclear factor of activated T-cells, and it's often abbreviated to NFAT, or NFAT, nuclear factor of activated T-cells. Right. So, as I said, it was often abbreviated to NFAT. Now, the nuclear, um, the nuclear factor of activated T cells has a special region, which is known as the SRR. So, this is the SRR of the nuclear factor uh, of activated T cells. And basically, this SRR is called that because it stands for serine-rich region which means that this portion of the protein has a huge number of serines in it. And basically, when the nuclear factor of activated T cells is inactive, which is what it usually is in most T cells, so if a T cell has not received signal 1 and signal 2, then this nuclear factor of activated T cells should obviously be turned off. Look at its name, nuclear factor of activated T cells. If a T cell is not activated, this nuclear factor should not be activated. So, in a T cell that is quiescent, that is not activated, this nuclear factor of activated T cells is inactive. And when it's inactive, what that means is it has loads of phosphate groups stuck 
on the serine residues in this serine-rich region, basically. Okay, and these phosphate groups uh, stuck on this serine-rich region mean that the uh, nuclear factor of active of the a nuclear factor of activated T cells basically takes on a conformation where it does not go into the nucleus. So it's in a conformation where its uh, nuclear import domain is not visible. Okay, so at the moment, this nuclear factor of activated T cells is in what is known as the cytoplasmic um, state. So you put obviously you put um, a C down there to denote that it's in the cytoplasm of the cell, and the reason it's in the cytoplasm of the cell is that its nuclear import domain is not visible, and the reason its nuclear import domain is not exposed is because these phosphate groups are bound to the serine-rich region. Now, when calcium goes up in the T cell. It's activated this calcium calmodulin complex, which has then activated the calcineurin enzyme, which cleaves phosphate groups off of serine residues. So it's going to come over here, and it's going to break off these phosphate groups from these serine residues. So what will happen is that this serine-rich region is going to lose its phosphate groups that are on these serine uh, residues, okay? And what that does is it changes the conformation of the nuclear factor of activated T cells so that a new domain becomes available. So I'll draw this here. And this domain is the nuclear import domain. Okay? And this basically allows the protein to go into the nucleus, to translocate to the nucleus. Okay. So what's now going to happen is that our nuclear factor of activated T cells is going to translocate into the nucleus. And when it goes into the nucleus, what it is now known as is the nuclear factor of activated T cells in the nucleus. So um, you, you put a little N down there. Okay, now this nuclear factor of activated T cells is then going to go into the nucleus and do all sorts of exciting things that are going to... Uh, continue this process of activation of the T cell, okay? So, this is now going to be the effector, basically. This is going to go on and cause activation, and we'll see how later. But what I want to talk about briefly now is um, how uh, certain um, immunosuppressant drugs work, because they work at the level of this calcineurin enzyme. Okay, and the two drugs that I want to discuss are cyclosporin, and uh, tacrolimus, which are two very, very powerful uh, immunosuppressants. Okay, and the way they work is by inhibiting this calcineurin enzyme. So, cyclosporin, basically, when you give cyclosporin, what it does is it goes into the cytoplasm of these T cells, and it binds to another protein, which is called cyclophilin, okay? So, cyclosporin binds to cyclophilin. Okay, so we will draw cyclosporin here, and we'll draw it binding to cyclophilin, which will have as this bigger protein. So, cyclophilin, we'll draw in pink here. So, this is cyclophilin, this one. And cyclosporin, our drug that we've given, uh, will have in green. So, this one is going to be in green. Okay, so there's cyclosporin bound to cyclophilin. And basically, this complex of cyclosporin with cyclophilin is going to go and inhibit the enzyme. So it's going to go and bind to this enzyme and inhibit it, basically. Okay, so if you inhibit that calcineurin enzyme, then even if signal 1 and signal 2 are delivered to your T cells, calcium will go up, calcium calmodulin complexes will form, but the calcineurin is not going to become activated. And if the calcineurin does not become activated, it can't cleave these phosphate groups of the serine residues of the nuclear factor of activated T cells. So the nuclear factor of activated T cells remains inactive. And that, if that remains inactive, then the T cell does not become activated. So you stop, basically, the activation of T cells. And T cells drive the adaptive immune response. So they are really important in the adaptive immune response. So if you don't get activation of T cells, you have an ama uh, a major immunosuppressant action there. So cyclosporin is a very potent uh, immunosuppressant. Now there's another drug. Where should I draw this? Uh, we'll put it here. There's another drug known as tacrolimus. Uh, which also has another name, which is FK506, uh, 
Okay, so FK506, where should I put that? FK506. Okay, and basically, this again binds to another protein in the cytoplasm of T cells, known as the FK, FK binding protein 12. And that's why it's important to know uh, this other name for tacrolimus, FK506. Otherwise, you'd think, FK binding protein? What, what, what? But no, because we know its old name uh, before it was, you know, actually um, used pharmaceutically was FK506. So that now makes sense. So here is the FK506, or the tacrolimus molecule, uh, binding to our FK uh, binding protein 12. So tacrolimus, or FK506, is in orange, and the FK uh, binding protein 12 here is in pink. Okay, and basically this complex of FK506 with the FK binding protein 12, again, it's going to go and bind to this calcineurin enzyme and inhibit it. And for the same reason as cyclosporin and cyclophilin complexes uh, stop uh, activation of T cells, FK506 and FK binding protein 12 complexes are also going to stop the activation of T cells. So again, tacrolimus is a very potent um, immunosuppressive agent. Okay, and we'll continue this discussion in the next video.